Private John Martin, also known as Giovanni Martino, was an Italian-American soldier who served as a trumpeter in the United States Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment. He is notable for being one of the few survivors of the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand on June 25, 1876. Martin was born in Italy in 1852 and immigrated to the United States, where he enlisted in the Army in 1873. He was assigned to the 7th Cavalry Regiment and served as a trumpeter, participating in several campaigns, including the Battle of Little Bighorn. During the battle, Martin was sent by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer to deliver a message to Captain Frederick Benteen, which made him one of the last men to see Custer alive. Martin survived the battle and later provided a detailed account of his experiences, which has become an important historical resource. A little before 8 o'clock on the morning of June 25th, my captain, Benteen, called me to him and ordered me to report to General Custer as orderly trumpeter. The regiment was then several miles from the divide between the Rosebud and the Little Bighorn. We had halted there to make coffee after a night march. We knew, of course, that plenty of Indians were somewhere near, because we had been going through deserted villages for two days and following a heavy trail from the Rosebud. And on the 24th we had found carcasses of dead buffalo that had been killed and skinned only a short time before. I reported to the general personally, and he just looked at me and nodded. He was talking to an Indian scout, called Bloody Knife, when I reported, and Bloody Knife was telling him about a big village in the valley, several hundred teepees, and about 5,000 Sioux. I sat down a little way off and heard the talk. I couldn't understand what the Indian said, but from what the general said in asking questions and his conversation with the interpreter I understood what it was about. The general was dressed that morning in a blue-gray flannel shirt, buckskin trousers, and long boots. He wore a regular company hat. His yellow hair was cut short. Not very short, but it was not long and curly on his shoulders like it used to be. Very soon the general jumped on his horse and rode bareback around the camp, talking to the officers in low tones and telling them what he wanted them to do. By 8.30 the command was ready to march and the scouts went on ahead. We followed slowly, about 15 minutes later. I rode about two yards back of the general. We moved on at a walk until about two hours later we came to a deep ravine, where we halted. The general left us there and went away with the scouts. I didn't go with him but stayed with the adjutant. This was when he went up to the crow's nest on the divide to look for the Sioux village that Bloody Knife had told him about. He was gone a long time, and when he came back they told him about finding fresh pony tracks close by and that the Sioux had discovered us in the ravine. At once he ordered me to sound officer's call and I did so. This showed that he realized now that we could not surprise the Sioux, and so there was no use to keep quiet any longer. For two days before this there had been no trumpet calls, and every precaution had been taken to conceal our march. But now all was changed. The officers came quickly, and they had an earnest conference with the general. None of the men were allowed to come near them, but soon they separated and went back to their companies. Then we moved on again, and after a while, about noon, crossed the divide. Pretty soon the general said something to the adjutant that I could not hear and pointed off to the left. In a few minutes Captain Benteen, with three troops, left the column and rode off in the direction that the general had pointed. I wondered where they were going because my troop was one of them. The rest of the regiment rode on, in two columns. Colonel Reno, with three troops on the left, and the other five troops, under General Custer, on the right. I was riding right behind the general. We followed the course of a little stream that led in the direction of the Little Big Horn River. Reno was on the left bank, and we on the right. All the time, as we rode, scouts were riding in and out, and the general would listen to them and sometimes gallop away a short distance to look around. Sometimes Reno's column was several hundred yards away, and sometimes it was close to us, and then the general had motioned with his hat, and they crossed over to where we were. Soon we came to an old teepee that had a dead warrior in it. It was burning. The Indian scouts had set it afire. Just a little off from that there was a little hill, from which Fred Gerard, one of the scouts, saw some Indians between us and the river. He called to the general and pointed them out. He said they were running away. The general ordered the Indian scouts to follow them, but they refused to go. Then the general motioned to Colonel Reno, and when he rode up the general told the adjutant to order him to go down and cross the river and attack the Indian village, 
and that he would support him with the whole regiment. He said he would go down to the other end and drive them, and that he would have Bintin hurry up and attack them in the center. Reno, with his three troops, left at once on a trot, going toward the river, and we followed for a few hundred yards and then swung to the right, down the river. We went at a gallop, too. Just stopped once to water the horses. The general seemed to be in a big hurry. After we had gone about a mile or two, we came to a big hill that overlooked the valley and we rode around the base of it and halted. Then the general took me with him and we rode to the top of the hill, where we could see the village in the valley on the other side of the river. It was a big village, but we couldn't see it all from there, though we didn't know it then. But several hundred teepees were in plain sight. There were no bucks to be seen. All we could see was some squaws and children playing and a few dogs and ponies. The general seemed both surprised and glad, and said the Indians must be in their tents, asleep. We did not see anything of Reno's column when we were up on the hill. I am sure the general did not see them at all, because he looked all around with his glasses, and all he said was that we had got them this time. He turned in the saddle and took off his hat and waved it so the men of the command, who were halted at the base of the hill, could see him and he shouted to them, Hurrah, boys, we've got them. We'll finish them up and then go home to our station. Then the general and I rode back down to where the troops were, and he talked a minute with the adjutant, telling him what he had seen. We rode on, pretty fast, until we came to a big ravine that led in the direction of the river, and the general pointed down there and then called me. This was about a mile down the river from where we went up on the hill, and we had been going at a trot and gallop all the way. It must have been about three miles from where we left Reno's trail. The general said to me, orderly, I want you to take a message to Colonel Bentin. Ride as fast as you can and tell him to hurry. Tell him it's a big village and I want him to be quick and to bring the ammunition packs. He didn't stop at all when he was telling me this and I just said, yes sir, and checked my horse when the adjutant said, wait, orderly, I'll give you a message. And he stopped and wrote it in a big hurry, in a little book, and then tore out the leaf and gave it to me. And then he told me, now, orderly, ride as fast as you can to Colonel Bentin. Take the same trail we came down. If you have time and there is no danger, come back, but otherwise stay with your company. My horse was pretty tired, but I started back as fast as I could go. The last I saw of the command, they were going down into the ravine. The gray horse troop was in the center and they were galloping. The adjutant had told me to follow our trail back and so in a few minutes I was back on the same hill again where the general and I had looked at the village. But before I got there I heard firing back of me and I looked around and saw Indians, some waving buffalo robes and some shooting. They had been in ambush. Just as I was approaching the summit of the elevation, I chanced upon Boston Custer. He was riding at a run, but when he saw me he checked his horse and shouted, where's the general? And I answered pointing back of me, right behind that next ridge you'll find him and he dashed on. That was the last time he was ever seen alive. When I got up on the hill, I looked down and there I saw Reno's battalion in action. It had not been more than 10 or 15 minutes since the general and I were on the hill, and then we had seen no Indians. But now there were lots of them, riding around and shooting at Reno's men, who were dismounted and in skirmish line. I don't know how many Indians there were a lot of them. I did not have time to stop and watch the fight. I had to get on to Colonel Bentin, but the last I saw of Reno's men they were fighting in the valley and the line was falling back. Some Indians saw me because right away they commenced shooting at me. Several shots were fired at Mefer or five, I think but I was lucky and did not get hit. My horse was struck in the hip, though I did not know it until later. It was a very warm day and my horse was hot, and I kept on as fast as I could go. I didn't know where Colonel Bentin was, nor where to look for him but I knew I had to find him. I followed our trail back to the place we had watered our horses and looked all around for Colonel Bentin. Pretty soon I saw his command coming. I was riding at a jog trot then. My horse was all in and I was looking everywhere for Colonel Bentin. As soon as I saw them coming I waved my hat to them and spurred my horse, but he couldn't go any faster. It was just a short distance before I encountered Colonel Bentin. He was riding quite a distance in front of his troops, with his orderly trumpeter, at a fast trot. The nearest officer to him was Captain Weir, who was at the head of his troop, about two or three hundred yards back. I saluted and handed the message to Colonel Bentin, 
And then I told him what the general said, that it was a big village, and to hurry. He said, where's the general now? And I answered that the Indians we saw were running, and I supposed that by this time he had charged through the village. I was going to tell him about Major Reno being in action too, but he didn't give me the chance. He said, what's the matter with your horse? And I said, he's just tired out, I guess. The colonel said, tired out? Look at his hip. And then I saw the blood from the wound. Colonel Benteen said, you're lucky it was the horse and not you. By this time, Captain Ware had come up to us and Colonel Benteen handed the message to him to read and told me to join my company. They gave me another horse and I joined my troop and rode on with them. The pack train was not very far behind them. It was in sight. Maybe a mile away and the mules were coming along. Some of them walking, some trotting, and others running. We moved on faster than the packs could go, and soon they were out of sight, except that we could see their dust. 